Welcome everyone to our webinar today on uh, reflections from inpatient palliative care chaplains, what they have seen and experienced uh, here during the pandemic. My name is Michael Skaggs. I'm the executive director of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab, and I'm very happy that the lab is co-sponsoring this webinar with Transforming Chaplaincy, our partners who are doing so much in such great research in healthcare chaplaincy. Uh, produced the Transforming Chaplaincy Fellows, one of whom is with us today, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'll just give a quick little technical introduction here and then hand it over to Paul for sort of the content, and then he will get the conversation off to the start. This webinar is being recorded, so if you're taking notes, don't worry. You don't have to catch everything. You can always go back and watch it later. We'll get this up on the website uh, tomorrow, maybe Monday or Tuesday. Uh, it can take a little time, but we'll have it up there and you can always go back and watch it. There's no login or anything, so you can see it that way. If you look at the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, there is a little bar that says questions. And if you have questions for the panel, just drop them in there. You can do it whenever. We'll hold them for the end for the open conversation, but as they come up, drop them in there. And then if you have technical difficulties, uh, you could put questions in there as well, or send me a message through the chat function, uh, and I'll do what I can to help you on that end. So with that in mind, there are the technicalities. Let me hand it over to Paul, and he will get the conversation started. Cool. Thank you, Michael. I so appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you, and that uh, the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab and Transforming Chaplaincy have continued to move forward with this partnership. Thanks to all of you for joining us here and for participating with us in this webinar. I am in just a moment going to introduce the uh, contributing panelists and talk about um, their expertise, but thankfully their own uh, stories, their own reflections about their experience and supporting people and staff um, during this time of the pandemic will, um, I think, will let you see their expertise unfold as it goes. For those who are tuning in for the United States, uh, we all know that we passed a pretty grim milestone here, uh, marking at least the um, progression of this disease, this illness, this virus, and 100,000 people that have uh, recently died, at least that we know about and have kept track of. So it's uh, a sobering time. I also kind of somehow need to add that I come from Minneapolis, St. Paul, and where I'm actually talking from is just a couple of miles from where uh, Mr. George Floyd was killed. So uh, this virus and what it has done to our communities, especially for people of color, is pretty drastic. So for how it is that the weight of what we are talking about is upon you, um, I'm, I'm so glad that the uh, panelists are here uh, to um, share in our community and how we do this work together. So let me uh, introduce them to you. Let me start with uh, Sarah Byrne Martelli. Uh, pull up my uh, notes here. Uh, this is a really brief slide, Sarah. Uh, much more can be said about you, uh, but currently serving as the inpatient chaplain, a division of the palliative care and geriatric medicine at Mass General Hospital. Dr. Bern Martelli has worked in hospice and palliative care since 2003 and is on the faculty currently of Harvard Medical School Center for Palliative Care. And in case Sarah looks familiar to you, she also hosts an annual Best Papers webinar with some other folks. So Sarah, so glad to have you among us. I'm also uh, privileged to introduce Jason Callahan to you, who currently serves as a palliative chaplain at the Thomas Palliative Care Unit at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in the Massey Ca Cancer Center there. Those are not his pajamas, you see. Uh, he is working today in-house. He's also an instructor at VCU, the Department of Patient Counseling and Pastoral Care. And if you're looking for a bumper sticker, um, for those who still have bumper stickers, he's a humanist chaplain looking to put a chaplain in every neighborhood in the country. I like that very much for all your future websites, Jason. Also, uh, a third panelist to be with us um, from the city of Chicago, um, the Reverend Edward Pinate. Edward works at Northwestern there in the heart of the city of Chicago and specializes in the area of palliative care. He also has expertise and competency in uh, bilingual, multicultural, Spanish, English speaking, which offers him that unique and I would say broad and important opportunity to work with Spanish speaking families, uh, patients and families. And then the last panelist that I'm privileged to have be among us is Rabbi Kara Tav. Um, so, uh, Kara, I so appreciate you also could have much more on this slide. Um, but a couple of big roles there in Brooklyn, uh, where she serves as the manager for the chaplaincy crowd as well as serves 
as the palliative care chaplain. So thanks to all four of you, Sarah, Jason, Edward, and Cara. So the way that we will uh, go through this uh, webinar today is that um, we have some questions that the panelists received in advance that they'll be able to respond and give some sense of these stories and reflections that um, we have. So here's the first question, kind of give a sense about uh, your setting. I'm wondering if each of you could please give a picture of your current setting where you work as an inpatient palliative care chaplain. And as you sketch this picture, please also tell us what it was like for you when the pandemic knowingly arrived within your context and kind of what it's like now. Cara, I'd love to start with you. Sure. Thanks, Paul. I'm happy to be here. I um, When I thought about this question or when I think about it, I think about um, sort of an, an opening um, maybe of, I would like to say an opening of a flower, although flowers are pretty and smell nice. Um, the hospital was very organized in their, in the way that they physically uh, created spaces for COVID positive patients. So we began with one unit where if you were, if you tested positive when you came into the hospital, you went to that unit. Um, that unit quickly filled and as we you know, as, as our population of COVID positive patients grew, the, we would just section off more and more first um, ICUs, then we make, we turned the, PACU, uh, the PACUs into um, ICUs for COVID positive patients. And at a certain point, our entire hospital was, uh, you know, actually almost 150 or 200% palliative care patients because we opened, um, we opened a separate uh, section across the street where we had um, the building that had gas in the walls and so we opened a, another sort of two floors of um, COVID positive patients there so we were we were at almost 200 percent capacity at, at some points. Paul we can't hear you. You can't hear me? No, you can't hear me. Could you also say a little bit about the chaplaincy side of that? As you kind of got hit really hard with uh, what, what that picture looks like for you as a chaplain, when it was, you know, before, after, now. Yeah. So at first, um, so the hospital was uh, clear, but kind of vague about um, what everyone's roles were going to be, because I think that, you know, this developed as it, as it opened, it, it developed, you know, it was, we were like, on one foot all the time for a while. And um, at first we really uh, were restricted from entering patient rooms. And one of like, what I feel was one of my first achievements was figuring out how the Catholic priest, who's one of the oldest and dearest members of our staff, um, could attend to the uh, benediction of the sick or the last rites of the Catholic patients. And so we got him a set of PPE with permission to enter the units. And it, that was very complicated. People didn't know that he was allowed to come in because no one was allowed to come in. It took some time and some doing a lot of um, a lot of work, but we eventually got him into the unit and he would stand at the corner where he could physically see they would move beds so that the patient was sort of not facing exactly because there's only so far you can move a, a bed with a patient attached. Um, but they would they would move beds so that he could see them and he would pray with them from the hallway um, until the um, yeah, period. He would pray with them from the hallway and then um, like over time, because there were so many patients in so much need, we, and we had received some PPE, we would, um, you know, whatever, we would don PPE and go in rooms. Um, we did, we spent a lot of time as the only um, non-medical personnel who would enter patient rooms and um, so that's sort of how things started out anyways. Well, thanks Cara, that's very helpful and um, I know you could say a lot more. I'm going to transition a little bit. I always, um, forgive me to everybody who's kind of tuning in, I forgot to say who I was. Uh, so uh, a lifelong quest to figure out who we are but uh, so currently I serve as the research staff chaplain at the University of Minnesota. Uh, at, uh, with M Health Fairview, technically what um, our health system is called. And I uh, 
The reason I get to be a part of this is uh, how I represent Transforming Chaplaincy is I serve as the convener for the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network. Thank you. Jason, you're next on my screen. I'd love to hear what kind of your setting, you know, kind of what that looked like a little bit for chaplaincy. Um, so VCU is downtown Richmond. We're a level one trauma center, teaching hospital. Um, chaplains in our institution have a mixed role, both for the university where we're instructors or professors for um, the CPE uh, students and residents, uh, and then the other clinical side where we supervise their clinical practice in the institution. Uh, you know, before then, we were really looking at COVID kind of as something that was outside of uh, our realm. We saw what was happening in New York, uh, realized Virginia hadn't really arrived, um, but we were preparing because we saw what was happening. So VCU was kind of ahead of the game just in preparation. Uh, I think when COVID actually arrived and we began getting the calls and updates on the patients um, that were infected with this, this virus, uh, we approached it from you know, a very prepared standpoint. Uh, unfortunately, you know, one of those things was the restrictive visitation rules that immediately got implemented. Um, and that created some problems for chaplains because we obviously had to find a way to uh, be able to go bedside if, if need be and provide support or find a way to do it through telechaplaincy. But the added bonus of having to be their family members on top of that and communicate where, um, especially within palliative care, where that, that um, physical proximity is so important for a lot of communications to happen, um, that was kind of difficult for us to learn how to do that. Um, so we got some other rules in place. Now we're in a lot better place as far as our protocols and what we expect, but uh, it was initially a struggle at first. Thank you. Thank you. Edward, you're next on my screen. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So we're also in the urban context of the city of Chicago and the way our inpatient palliative team is structured to, to respond to all our consults in the inpatient setting is by the structure of two teams. And those two teams consist of palliative care physician, social worker, an APN, nurses, and uh, and there's two teams that respond to all consults typically, and there's one chaplain who is myself responding to all of these consults with both teams. Um, I think the major shift of this, what it prompted for the palliative care team in this teaching hospital, uh, which is also a trauma one, level one hospital, 900 plus beds in the heart of Chicago. Uh, was a restructuring as part of the preparation phase. And the restructuring uh, looked in ways to make more teams. And so what became a two team palliative care structure became really a, a five team palliative, a, a three team palliative care structure. And how it responded was one team was going to respond to all non COVID uh, consults. And so throughout all the inpatient setting, the, the team was gonna to respond to all of that. But also they, looking at the response to COVID patients, they were going to structure one team to, to respond to all the ICU COVID patients. And all the, the other team, the third team was going to respond to all the COVID confirmed um, non-ICU patients. And so still, doing our best to have multiple ID team members represented in each team, but being that there's one palliative care chaplain, I had to now uh, balance my myself and my energy and my efforts with, with this new structure, right? The, the other is, uh, I think what many were accustomed to, we were used to in-person uh, consults. And so a major piece that, uh, we experienced uh, not just the palliative care team, but the institution was transitioning to telehealth, telechaplaincy, uh, whether that was by phone or by video conferencing, right? But it was part of the measures that the institution took to minimize exposure, direct contact with COVID patients, which I think we're not, we weren't the only hospital to make measures like that. Um, so that, that was a key major piece of how we were responding to consults now during the pandemic and still in these days. The, the other major change that um, 
that I can identify was in terms with relationship with the spiritual care department. And that is one, um, not just for the spiritual care department, but for the whole institution being a teaching hospital, uh, learners were not permitted anymore, trying to minimize how many people were accessing the hospital. And so we didn't have learners, we didn't have medical students, including CPE interns, right? And, and so the bandwidth of the spiritual care department was impacted as well. Uh, we didn't have uh, many interns that would do normal coverage for on-call shifts, et cetera. So, so that had an impact on my person, not only with uh, the three, per, three structure of this team, this new uh, response, but also the demands of the spiritual care department that we were experiencing and I had to contribute as well. And so there was, there was much demand and, and I had to work my way just as you all do uh, very wisely of how to best use myself as a resource to, to all these different demands. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that um, part, of, part of that, uh, the telehealth, piece was a major piece of adjustment for many because especially a palliative care specialist, we're, we're used to not just in person or in terms of verbal communication, but nonverbal communication as well for many different matters. And that, that goes out the door in a way really quick when you have to facilitate these complex decisions in via even teleconferencing video or, or phone call, right? right? The other piece was that we also had to navigate through a change of minimizing personnel in the hospital in the sense of how many people worked at the hospital at a given time and who, how many people were going to work from home. And we experienced that dynamic as well from spiritual care and as a palliative care team, right? So, so that's a bit of a, a picture of, of what we experienced. There. So I have to say to all of you panelists and getting to go to Sarah here to get your sense of this, um, knowing as we know that stories beget stories, hold on to all these millions of questions that all four of you want to ask each other. So, because um, I know as you're kind of telling each other your own context, so hold on to that. Uh, Sarah, would you give a snapshot of kind of where you're at, you know, picture-wise in terms of, you know, um, what that looks like chaplaincy, but also kind of palliative care us. Sure. Um, so, you know, being at Mass General, we have a very large palliative care department. So I'm under the department of the division of palliative care, and I'm the sole chaplain with uh, three social workers and many fellows um, and MDs and NPs. So um, the first week or two, we were all working from home and doing phone consults, kind of like everyone else, and had access to the EMR at home and did a lot of calls. But then Pretty soon after things really started ramping up and MGH being really kind of a center to receive lots and lots of COVID patients, um, we went to all hands on deck uh, and have been kind of for about eight, I don't know, I don't even know, eight weeks now. Um, and what was really amazing and, and interesting for us as a division of palliative care is we were really focusing on trying to to innovate and to be creative about how we can really care for folks. So many, you know, many of the floors were turned into ICUs, like Cara mentioned, you know, um, you know, staff was moved around to different units. But what our team kind of the palliative care team got together and was able to kind of pull together this, this idea, this model, uh, what we call the PCCU, the Palliative Care Compassion Unit. So it was kind of a CMO end of life. Um, specifically um, with the palliative care folks staffed, and it was a really um, a dedicated floor because normally we are just all over the different units. We don't have a dedicated palliative care or hospice floor. Um, and since we weren't having any GIP hospice patients here, there was also a need to really uh, support staff and do a lot of education with staff around end of life and end of life support. Um, and so every day we would gather as a team you know, uh, responding clinician attending uh, an NP social work and me, and then we would we would round together and go see. We did a lot of joint visits, and and actually it's interesting because we have so many. We have actually four palliative care teams going at any time, and I'm only one person. So I, you know, I'm kind of going in different places and you know, really trying to seek referrals and doing some joint visits. But I'm always like really kind of doing triage all the time to see, you know where I'm 
where I'm best and most needed. Um, but so what was really great about this PCCU model was that we were there was a real um, truly interprofessional model of care. And it was very efficient. I think because of sometimes like, okay, Sarah, you got this and social worker, okay, go over here. So you're gonna call this family and this person's gonna do that. So it was actually, even though sort of initially pulling it together was a lot more work, um, it led to really, really good interprofessional palliative care. And what's nice and real camaraderie, I think, and I know that the nursing staff on those dedicated units appreciated it. Um, and we did a lot to support the staff on that unit, not just education wise, but also in terms of gathering together to debrief, to support them and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, so in that way, it was actually really good. We've actually now kind of wound down from that PCCU model and are now back to doing our regular inpatient palliative care consults now that a lot more palliative care patients are back in the hospital. Um, so that's what it's like, but we still have many, many COVID ICU patients. So um, uh, the, the rest of the chaplaincy department, many of them were, have been working from home this whole time doing telehealth visits um, and really supporting families. And then now we have a few chaplains, staff chaplains in house at any given time, but we don't have any priests really until like this week. Now we have some like special priests who have been supporting um, just COVID patients from the archdiocese, mm -hmm. which is good. So we have a lot of Catholic patients here. Um, yeah, so. Sarah, thanks so much. And for all of you giving a sense of uh, that snapshot context of your setting, given that spiritual care integrally involves kind of emotional support, uh, that's what I'd love to shift to for patients and families. So without naming names for confidentiality reasons, of course, and if you're open to it, I'm kind of curious about which memory story of a patient or family care situation kind of has stayed with you through this pandemic. And I'd love to start with you, Jason. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so here at VCU, we, we have an interesting setup. We have an inpatient palliative care unit um, where we also have GIP, um, but the largest part of our service is the console service where we'll go see patients who are managed by other teams throughout the hospital. Um, this one patient and family in particular that, that comes to mind when I, I think about the context of COVID that is always going to stick with me was actually during a time period in which our inpatient unit was shut down for a couple of weeks. Uh, this was a console patient on the uh, medical respiratory ICU, had a bunch of comorbidities, COPD, heart failure, everything to, to make matters worse is he was from India and he was isolated from his family. And this is a few months ago. Um, so the irony is that family members managed to get a flight over here right at the time that we started having some travel restrictions. So they couldn't go back to India. Um, they very, had very limited knowledge and ability to navigate the environment here. And it was at the exact time that we started getting our first visitor restrictions. And one of those stipulations was that uh, we couldn't have any visitors in the hospital if you were not in the life, essentially. Um, this was extremely difficult because as well, this, this person having to contract some COVID as well. Um, so family essentially was in the hospital and were told that if they left, they would not be able to come back. The whole reason that they came over here was to, to be with him. Uh, what ultimately ended up happening is they were in contact with other family members in India and they said, hey, you have to go in there, you have to provide these prayers, you have to do this and that. And the family wasn't able to do that. However, we ultimately managed to, to put these prayers outside of the room. Um, and the family members, unfortunately, were not satisfied with that because one of the particular things about these particular prayers are the inclusion of all of your senses, being able to take these things in and, and have them living in you. So what we eventually had to do uh, to resolve the situation was we got PPE, we followed all the protocols that we think we would have followed um, if the rules had been written. This was at a time where we didn't even have the rules uh, about going to see COVID patients as well. Um, so we had them go by the room, they were able to do what they had to do, but we also had to have them sign uh, an agreement that said that they were aware of the complications and risks and had to self-isolate and weren't allowed to come back to the hospital. So essentially this was the goodbye visit um, for this family before any of the, the newer rules that have recently come out were put in there. But 
Um, it was a mix because there was a lot of moral distress. Obviously, the staff knew that he was going to die, but the family wanted to keep pushing, but we didn't want to push the end of life uh, and comfort measures on them. They had to come to their own conclusions, and how are you going to do this with all the isolation? Um, but ultimately, we did the best that we can, and I believe in hindsight, looking back, we followed what the current protocols would be for seeing a COVID patient. But that was hard when you're entering this new territory and everyone, uh, not just the patient, but the family members, but all of the staff are wondering how are we supposed to do this? There's no precedent. So that's gonna stick with me always, I think, in all the visits I go moving forward. I think it's gonna stay with me too, Jason. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. Carter, um, among a hospital full of people with COVID, I, you have one, one that you could offer? <laughs> do I have one? How much time do you have? Um, so the one that, that, um, I thought about when I thought about answering this question was really, um, she was a very, uh, complicated patient. She would have been a complicated patient, um, in regular circumstances. She had a lot, she had a tremendous amount of organ failure. She had, um, uh, you know, a, a hospital born, uh, infection. Uh, that was a antibiotic resistant, and she was COVID positive, and she, so she was in a negative. Uh, she was in a negative pressure room. She was in like a special section of the hospital, and um, her family. Obviously, no one could come to the. No one was allowed in our hospital. Like technically, we you were allowed to have one visitor um, if you were end of life, but in some ways, you know. M a high majority of the patients in the hospital were end of life. And so there, there really wasn't, uh, we couldn't differentiate who needed to have a family member and who didn't because everyone really did. And, and so no one had them mostly. Um, we had all, I, so I did a video conference with, um, on the recommendation of the, the medical team worked together with the spiritual care team like the palliative care team, the patient's medical team, and the the spiritual care group all worked together, and we had um, a group video chat with all of the members of this patient's family, and they were in all different parts of the country. Um, you know, one was in the Northeast, you know, so she was in the right time zone, but everyone was in different time zones except for her. And basically what happened was um, through uh, a series of pre-phone calls where we prepared them for what they were going to see. Really, the, um, the reason we had to prepare them is that our experience of these patients was that they would predominantly walk into the hospital. They would come in, they would sit in chairs in the emergency department, texting their person at home to say, I got here, you know, I'm fifth in line. And that was two weeks before I was making these phone calls where the patient was intubated and really at the like very close to the end of their life. You know, complete organ failure. And I mean, and so um, I got everyone on the phone. We did a pre call where I explained what was going on. It was, you know, there were a lot of questions about code changing because the family was like, she walked into the hospital two weeks ago. What do you mean we should make her DNR and DNI? That doesn't seem. So it, it, after all of that, uh, we had these phone calls. We took everyone in the room. We, as, as an I, I as the representative of everyone, took everyone on the screen into the room and we did a full survey. We showed them all of, the, like we described it as if they, you were sitting down next to them in the room. And, and I actually, well, I couldn't sit because there was no furniture, but I like leaned down as if I was sitting next to the patient holding the screen. I showed them the bottles, you know, like I moved the screen around. I showed them the bottles and the tubes and the ventilation going out the window, the door, the way things were fogged up on the, like the negative pressure room on the, on the, on the wall. And um, I previously in the pre-call asked them to talk with to talk with her and to explain to her, you know, about the medical decisions they were making for her. And, you know, I, I sort of prepped them to tell this patient how much you love them and how sorry you are that they're, they can't physically be in the room with them, but, you know, their hearts were with her and 
the decisions they were making were the thing, the decisions that they thought were best for her right now. And they, you know, all of the children were um, of one mind, which is interesting because they were all of different faiths. Um, mm. And they worked together brilliantly. And it was a very hard, long call, but um, two important things happened. One was that they did change her code status, like by the grace of God. And then they were there, like I, I stayed um, outside the negative pressure room. And so I had to like doff all the PPE and wait there. And then I went back in so that they could say goodbye after the machinery was off and she was no longer ventilated um, as if it was as if they were there. I did my best to be, um, you know, to, to be holding their hands as it were, uh, but I, I'm never going to forget her or them because it was such a beautiful unified family they called me the following week to wow. thank me and and to say that they didn't even under they had no idea what palliative care was until they were in this crisis and they're never going to forget it and like every anything they could do and blah 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 it was lovely oh, for, yeah that's, that's rich and um, complex and sorrow filled um, and heartening um, what they received thank you um, I'm going to go, Edward, to you, uh, if you would. Um, yeah. I don't get a story again. I know you can share a little bit live. Uh, yeah, yeah. The story I, I, I want to share today and has stayed with me is a story of a family who, who had multiple family members admitted. Uh, so a total of four family members. Um, and three of, uh, three of them were in our hospital and one of them were uh, at a neighboring nearby hospital and all of them were admitted in, and they were in the ICU. All of them were intubated and sedated. So, so aside from that, there was family at home who were confirmed COVID, but they were non-symptomatic or their symptoms could be managed at home. And, and so this is quite a, this was quite weighty. Uh, for the family, as you can imagine. And so to have multiple family members and, and to hold this emotional space and accompany them for not just a week, but over a month, right? And continue to do that uh, even to this day is, is quite a, a heartbreaking and demanding our, our own humanity to hold this space with them. Um, and during this, this course, uh, these weeks, um, two of them did die, right? And they died in, in a period of 10 days uh, in between. And so uh, I, to accompany them from day one of when our team got involved to build rapport, to uh, facilitate needs assessments, including the exploration of uh, of their hopes, of their how they would want to be cared at different stages for each family member and coordinating all these team dynamics that were so doing an excellent job to express their compassion is, is quite a, a demand, not just log logistically, but on our own humanity. And, and their stories of this family has, has remained with me in the sense that they remind me of of many things that I'll share in a moment, but uh, it was heartbreaking. And the, the emotional manifestations from one spectrum to the other that we experienced with multiple family members throughout these weeks was quite intense, to say the least. It was anger, it was sadness, it was fear, you know. And, and so even during moments when there were no changes, but then there was another week where we had to break bad news, or there was another week where things did change. And then there came this moment where the other two uh, patients who, who are still admitted came to a point where they were stable enough to be extubated, are more coming about, and they were taken to a, a non-ICU floor, and and they're come, becoming aware of where they're at and what day it is and et cetera. And they're still are not aware of their, their two family members who have died. So 
So I offer this story one because it has remained with me when uh, with four family members and two of them died, but they really become symbolic that this was not the only complex case that we navigated for one week, two weeks, but this was one of dozens of multiple family members that we had to support a company, hold the space for many weeks simultaneously throughout this, these weeks. Um, and and you're still, you still have a lot of fresh human reactions. I can say that for myself about this. Yeah. You know, Edward, uh, Ed, uh, another uh, powerful story as well. It was amazing to me. I don't know if you saw it with your other co-panelists, but the minute you said like multiple family members, everybody's like kind of nodding their head because it just, yeah, the, the interrelatableness of this uh, um, illness is profound. Um, Sarah, love to hear one from you um, story. Unfortunately, it's why I'm nodding my head was because it was a similar case. I mean, I can think of I'm even sitting here thinking, well, should I tell this one or that one? And because I've, there's so many, some are COVID patients and some are just reg, regular inpatient palliative care who couldn't grieve or be supported in the way that they needed to or would have been otherwise because they're alone at the bedside at end of life. That was hard in a general sense. But I think um, for me, I can, one patient that I had was um, a husband and wife who were both COVID positive, intubated, both in the ICU, and the husband was extubated and had a trach and was was now sort of on a, a st on a, on the floor, um, but his wife began actively dying, and so they actually, you know, and, and so he's COVID positive still, so there's all the PPE and all this stuff, and he's on the ventilator with the trach, and so there's, you know, it's a kind of a high you know, stress situation in terms of the PPE and the staff. And it was early on too. So I think that the level of distress was just kind of steady and heightened. Um, so they Zoom, they like FaceTimed, um, you know, his wife's face to this patient who's on, you know, who has a trach and a ventilator, you know, showing him his wife. And this is the last time he's going to see his wife as she's actively dying. And then, she died later that day and then the staff asked me to to go in and to support him and so he was actually the first covid patient i went in to visit but i thought you know i'm not gonna hi, i can't call this guy i can't talk on the phone with him like what would i do you know and i need to be present with him as best i can and so i you know got everything on and and went in and was with him and you know it was so hard because in situations like that, we know how to name the grief, right? We know how to like kind of communicate and name what's going on. At the same time, it was not entirely clear what his mental status really was, having been, you know, in an ICU for 18 days or something. And so he would respond and he could nod and kind of mouth words, but it was just so hard to know how, how to support him in that grief. Um, and in his own experience of still being in the hospital, and it was very hard to assess kind of what was going on with him and his response. And so, you know, I tried to tread lightly and to to really support him. And I knew he was Catholic, so I did pray with him and and sit with him. But in situations like that, normally outside of COVID, I would have just kind of, you know, hunkered down and be present and be there. And I was aware even in myself of my own like conflicting kind of, do I hold this hand or do I not? Like how close do I get? How do I name that for him? And there was just a lot of team distress around it. There was just such a, a sense of like, you know, this family, they're losing, you know, one parent and the other parent is very debilitated. And this is like, there was a sense of like, this is not how it should be. You know, this is wrong. There's something wrong about this. And we, there's so little we can do to really, to fix it. Um, so for me, that, that was, that was hard. It was, you know, I was glad I could support some of the staff too and talking through some of the nurses to talk through you know, supporting him, but they were the ones with him every day. And, um, and I'm, their care was amazing too. Uh, yeah, you um, use the phrase, Terry, uh, what it was like to tread lightly with him. But as you're kind of telling the story, as you're um, vividly describing that, uh, man, my own kind of sense was like walking in the room. I, I mean, I would have been aware of like every step in that kind of thickened moment in time. So I, uh, to you and to all your co-panelists, thanks for just giving us a tip of the iceberg of so much that you could share. 
I want to be sensitive to the Q&A before Michael uh, Skaggs gets back on for that. So uh, I got two more questions I want to ask and we don't have enough time. <laughs> so I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, some of you probably saw the Pew research that had come out uh, in about a week or so ago, that 25% of the people, you know, over 10,000 folks said that their faith had grown during this time of the pandemic. Uh, so religiosity, existential kinds of things, faith, I'm kind of wondering, you know, in a minute or so, could you kind of share what, how that's showing up for you, either by struggle for the people you're seeing or whether you're seeing like people say a renewed sense of coping or something with whatever, how they make sense of their worldview. Um, Sarah, can you go back to you to start off for that one? Um, sure, uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I hear some echoes, maybe someone can mute, I guess. Um, I know for me, I think, um, We've, in many ways, I feel like we're still in the thick of it, and it's hard for me to, I feel like we haven't, we're not really completely out of it, so it's hard to get a little perspective. I feel very much in the midst of this place. I think I've been thinking a lot about isolation. I think that's a big theme right now, isolation, um, loneliness. We've seen a lot on the news about people dying alone, and I think one thing we've brought as chaplains is kind of to say, um, you know, is dying alone or dying lonely? Are those the same thing? How can we be present? Um, you know, what does it mean to die alone? Um, and how can we can we support that? Can we support people in that? Um, I see, you know, I also see a lot, like on the flip side of that, I see a lot of gratitude. I see so much camaraderie and connection. I see, you know, amongst the staff and, and I, I see so much love and compassion, whether, you know, people are spiritual or name that sort of think about it theologically or in their meaning making or not. I know for me, you know, I think it's deepened and broadened my practice um, and has just really reminded me that we're in this together and to really draw on whatever sources of comfort we have, whether that's music, whether that's prayer, whether that's just even just a Zoom, um, yeah, for me, you know, it, we had to rethink what makes people have find peace, right? And what, what we can offer. And we're good at being creative, I think. So um, yeah, that's what I've been thinking about. Thank you, Sarah. Andrew, I'm gonna go in line, you're next on my screen. How about you, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think human beings, try to, in the moment, figure out how to cope. And so I say that because I, as, as I've witnessed the patients, their families and staff, they have, I have heard many times, and I have seen it in practice, uh, many draw on their spirituality or spiritual activities or religious activities to help them navigate and help cope during this moment. Uh, I certainly heard that and I've seen that in the middle of this experience of the pandemic, people drawing from their faith traditions, from spirituality, activities, whatever those may be to cope. Right? For the people, at, the families who have experienced a member of their family die, I, I did identify and I did see um, struggle that their faith has been shaken and I see the ongoing struggle of why and et cetera, right? The reason I'm pointing this out is that even before this, it, it may be that for several, they were, they were drawing from their spirituality and religious faith traditions to help them cope. During this moment, they have drawn from that as well to help them navigate this and be strong in this and endeavor through this period. And I also suspect, and I've yet to confirm this, but I suspect that spirituality and them drawing to, to continue moving forward, whether that's with spiritual struggle or growth, post-traumatic growth, it can play an essential role moving forward. I don't know what that looks like, but I suspect that will be the case. Thank you, Edward. Building on Edward and uh, Sarah, Jason, I'd uh, love to hear your contributions on this subject too. So it's, it's interesting. I, I think I would echo a lot of the same points, but at, at the same time, I think we, we have to highlight, um, at least from what I've experienced with people, there's a, a collective 
a grieving and struggle going on because everybody is essentially being affected by it. And, and that's just being added on top of the things that we've already kind of been dealing with. And anytime you don't have what is normal to you, you know, you're going to try to reach down into your bag and pull out whatever is foundational for a lot of people that, you know, is their, their sense of faith or spirituality or significance, whatever that may be um, within your, your belief system. So I think right now, um, would be a natural time for us to, to kind of be present in the fact that there is something outside of our norm that that is in fact more uh, important at this time. I think uh, we see a lot of the superficial things kind of going away. So um, I think patients, family members are, are now focusing more on those things that uh, they truly do value. Um, obviously as a result of that within the healthcare setting, you know, the realities of what they're dealing with, you know, they have to address that. Chaplaincy, of course, is just another route that a person could go to, to help be supported with those existential issues. Cool. Thanks, Jason. This is very helpful. Thinking about how people are prioritizing. Cara, you got the last word on this subject before uh, going to Michael Skaggs here for the Q&A. So my last word is um, is is about God because I am sure that people of faith and people less of faith are thinking about God now, especially. And my, my experience predominantly with staff because they were the people who I was physically present with, but also because patients I didn't speak with mostly. Um, and families too, you know, they, a, lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of concern, a lot of where is that God that was like my rock? Where, you know, that God was my center. Or, or even like my ability to be in my garden was at the core of who I am. And I can't have that. And the way, the way I expressed it to them and the way that it was comforting to me, because I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is, um, is that I, I would often but often talk about how I was sure that that God was really sad too, and that God is feeling really lost at this time also, and and that maybe there's some comfort in companionship, and and I could I could say to the staff that I know that in some ways they are being God's hands in the hospital, and that as chaplains we. We can only hope that we are accompanying them at this time, and in in that way, we are trying to bring bring some I don't know how else to say it companionship um, to this time, and and I I sincerely hope that thinking about God is so compassionate that God is also sad and maybe crying also with us um, was the only way I could tackle those questions. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, we do have a few minutes left perhaps more than I've ever left in a webinar for Q&A. So I hope we can get to some of these questions and some very sobering, uh, you know, sublime topics that all of you have delved into. So again, a huge thanks to all of you as panelists. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Skaggs. Thank you all for, uh, for just wonderful insights and, and your stories are just so rich. And I think that for me, as uh, as a non-chaplain hearing these stories is uh, is just really uplifting and humbling at the same time so thank you for sharing them we do have time for a couple of questions so we'll we'll get through as many of these as we possibly can and i'm just going to sort of uh, you know throw it out there if if someone is not named and then uh, you know as you feel uh ready to answer please do so the question is specifically uh what your experience has been with with your institutions issuing you with ppe and other necessary equipment I'm going to broaden that question to say, what has your experience been with integrating into the entire team? So not just whether you have PPE, but where do you fit into the sort of the entire structure of the, of the care uh, encounter? 
I can own that. Um, so even before pandemic, my experience with the palliative care team and institutionally has been one of IDT, interdisciplinary. In other words, there's integration, not a multiple, multiple discipline team in a sense that there's multiple disciplines represented. But the IDT for me is really an embedded culture for us, even how we respond to consults. In other words, when we make decisions about who will respond to this consult from this team or that team, it comes from a shared decision-making model for our team to make the decision who from our team, whether it's the chaplain, the social worker, the physician, or the fellow, who is going to respond to this, to make first contact, to introduce the team, to explore goals, to explore hopes, to et cetera. And so for me, in my context, the culture has been one that, uh, that has been IDT in that sense. And this was key for us because as we entered this, this experience of the pandemic, this was already there and this is how we function. And it, it helped us respond at a, as an IDT, the explosions of a consult uh, experience. There was just no way if it was a, going to be a model of physician top down type of model that they were gonna own every single time. That would just stretch us to our limits. Uh, for me, I think um, MGH, so we went quickly to all wearing scrubs on the team. I'm actually wearing scrub pants right now, but I put on a different shirt for this. <laughs> I should have gone like Jason and stuck with it. But so I had, yeah, I've been wearing scrubs now for many, many weeks. And um, in terms of PPE and access to that, that has not been an issue here. We were doing the thing where, you know, the N95s, we were cleaning them and sending them off and this whole kind of very big system here in Boston. Um, so, you know, fortunately for our team here, it has not been an issue. And there is never really kind of an, a thing of like, am I essential or not essential or any of that stuff? Luckily, I mean, I'm only one chaplain in a very large team. So I think I, I have a slightly different situation in terms of being really able to in, be fully integrated at the same time, especially for this PCCU model where we were rounding as a team it was just, we were all in the same boat and all in the same clothes and all in the same PPE um, and just utilizing our particular skills while assessing, you know, assessing for other issues and family issues and pain, of course, as we, as we do for all patients. Um, so for me, you know, I, I, um, I felt thankful that I, that, that was one thing that was not causing us distress here. Sure. So for us, um, we kind of went through the same thing. Um, our, we have the, the two-tiered approach being a teaching hospital because of the university side, everything got shut down. But on the clinic side, we are definitely classified as essential personnel and we're, we're there all the time. Uh, when the hospital decided that they were going to offer um, scrubs to the folks that don't traditionally wear it. I just went out and got my own because I said I might as well at least look good when I'm doing my job. So <laughs> that was that was something that um, it was important. And, and and I'll say this because the reality is that was an indicator that chaplains, you know, this pastoral identity that comes from a church tradition that we have had. Like the reality is we're clinical. Like why wouldn't I be wearing scrubs every day anywhere? I used to wear a, a bow tie and a badge, and that's what people saw, but now this really helped us feel like we were a part of the team, I guess you would say. And it's one of those things where I think moving forward, I'm probably gonna just keep wearing scrubs even after this pandemic is over. So that was one of those things, but just like everyone else was saying, specifically palliative care, we look at it as an approach to we are palliative. So it was never a point that chaplains weren't gonna be integrated um, we are being protected just like everybody else and the same rules that applies to people who are giving direct patient care, it applies to us as well. Um, so it's it's kind of cool. I will take this stuff off, obviously, when we go home, you know, we try to create separation because uh, obviously in the clinic, we are so integrated. Wonderful. Cara, did you want to add anything? If not, we have plenty of questions. Um, 
No, I'll just say that um, when push came to shove here, everyone mattered. Everyone who was physically on the plant mattered. And so we divided up. We were, I wasn't a palliative care chaplain and I wasn't the manager of a team. I was just one of the chaplains. And we all, as you say, we all looked the same because we were all in scrubs. And it, it was just like a, wherever you were is where you worked. And if you moved, you moved and then you worked there. It wasn't, uh, there weren't any, there weren't any, uh, there was a lot of transparency, porousness. This next question ties into some things that we've talked about here and there over the past couple of weeks. And we actually had an entire webinar on staff care that uh, the lab and Transforming Chaplaincy co-sponsored. So I would encourage you to go check that out. But the question is, what do you see the healthcare, the, the physical healthcare workers that you're working with in these settings, what do they need in terms of support? Or what has worked for you? What have those conversations looked like since this all began? I'm happy to begin there. Um, I've done a tr not just, I shouldn't say I, we, my team and I have done a tremendous amount of work with staff here. And I um, I don't even know where to begin. We started, you know, we started with printing um, spiritual message of the week cards that we would go around to the different units and we would hand out and we thought that was a really great idea, but like, by the time we had gone through one shift of them, you know, like less than a week, we started to reprint them as spiritual message of the moment cards. <laughs> it was like a week was a joke, right? And then we, we stopped being able to do that because like there was no, first of all, you couldn't pass things out because you couldn't touch things and you couldn't put things down. And we stopped being able to pass things out. And so we would have, um, we tried to have these huddles. We tried to meet with the staff in the ED or, or in other departments and just get together with them. and lift them up or have them lift each other up. But then it was it was too chaotic to be having them huddle. They didn't have time and it was it was just too much. And so we started to do like one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of gatherings with um, nurses or we would catch a couple of nurses in the hall. They would pull us aside and they'd be like, you gotta, you gotta help us. You gotta tell us something that's gonna make us better because we can't handle this anymore. And so we did, we did, we tried to do a sort of non-touching blessing of the hands where we had, we, we had them lift their hands up. And we blessed the hands up in the air. And then that, that got too chaotic because there were so many codes, they were happening every couple of minutes and people had to run and it was just really too much chaos. And so we, one of the, um, one of the nurses came to us and said, you know, sometimes we're the only person in the room when a patient dies and we don't know what to do. And so, and we can't call you because we don't have time because the, it's like we had to fill the bed and so there were people waiting. And, and so we, cre we, we developed this, um, I'll share it with you so that you can share it out. Um, it's actually out of, um, let me tell, it's out of like the University of uh, UCSF, University of um, California, San Francisco. Um, the health service care uh, pro uh, project there created uh, a, short, a brief blessing for medical staff to offer when clergy or chaplain isn't present at the death. And it's like a tiny little, um, we made a million of them, we laminated them, we had them in our pockets, we passed them out everywhere we went, and they became sort of a hot number for a while. But it was sort of like, we just did whatever we could as as it came up, we tried to, whatever, be creative. Yeah. Well, I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I realize we're coming up on the top of the hour if we're not there already. Uh, so let me thank you all again for being with us this afternoon. Paul, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close out here? Just that I think Chaplain's Innovation Lab is pretty fantastic and they keep having good webinars down the road. So check you out in Transforming Chaplaincy for future events and things Wait coming up. our way. Well, thank you, Paul and uh, George Fitchett. I know you're you're out there somewhere. Uh, thank you for Transforming Chaplaincy co-sponsoring these webinars. This is just such a wonderful way to engage uh, a community that we're so happy to be a part of uh, and to continue the conversation. I'll remind everyone, 
this is recorded, so it will go up on the website at chaplaincyinnovation.org in the next couple of days. And everybody who was registered will get an email to that effect, so you'll have a link that's right to it. You can see all the material there. And we look forward to having you join us again. Thank you all, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.